And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's trying that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. Yes, indeed. That's right, Greta. It is Friday, and this is our own personal Friday protest. Climate Change Roundtable, Episode 95, Climate Trial of the Century, Man versus Stein, Part 2. I'm your host, Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate at the Heartland Institute. And I want to tell you that in the second week of this uh, so-called defamation trial, where serial litigator and special climate snowflake Michael Mann sued Stein and others for libel, the proceedings featured some notable developments and surprising revelations. To discuss this, Phelan McAleer, a filmmaker and journalist who is attending the trial in federal court in Washington, D.C., will be joining us on episode 95 today. Also joining us, we have our regular panelist, Dr. H. Sterling Burnett, director of the Arthur B. Robinson Center for Climate at the Heartland Institute, and Lunea Lucan, a research fellow at the Robinson Center. Also vice president of communications at the Heartland Institute, Jim Lakely is joining us to provide color commentary and some other fun things. Hi. Welcome to everybody. Good to be on. I just want to say at the outset, as part of my protest, I've decided not to glue my hand to my keyboard. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good a good or, choice. Or any of the art in my house. So. Yeah. Just, so anyway, we're we're gonna flip the script a little bit on this show. Instead of doing our craziest climate stories of the week first, we're going to get to our special guest first and talk about the trial, and then after that, we will get to our usual affair of claim uh, of crazy climate stories of the weeks and cartoons and fun stuff like that. Anyway. Uh, Jim Lakely has been working with Phelan directly and watching a lot of this trial. So I'm going to hand most of this over to Jim and let him begin uh, the process and the questions and the ideas. Go ahead. Thanks, uh, Phelan. It's so great to have you on uh, on the show. And before we get to some questions for you, because you are in the courtroom every day, you and your lovely wife, Ann McElhenney, are there uh, uh, reporting on this. You have a a podcast that everybody listening to this podcast and watching this on YouTube must go find and listen to. That's Climate Change on Trial. You can also find it at climatechangeontrial.com. Uh, as I have discovered, as I, yeah, I've, if, of the people at the Heartless Institute, I've probably listened or watched more of this trial than anybody. Um, it's not that I'm not busy, but I can have it on the background while I'm doing other stuff. And I learned something that made sense to me because this is what uh, Phelan and Ann are doing, is they have actors reading the transcripts from the trial. And so while I, I was thinking we could share clips of it on this show and talk about it because this is the climate trial of the century. Um, but what you will get at the Climate Change on Trial podcast that uh, Phelan and Andu is this actor is reenacting some highlights from this trial. And there are plenty of highlights on this trial. So Phelan, welcome to the show. And, and uh, I, I wonder if you could just start by saying, you know, why did you decide to cover this trial so extensively? And, and it seems to me you're maybe the only one really doing it. Yeah, th th that's actually the shocking part of it, that nobody else is doing it. Um, th this is this I would argue is not climate trial of the century. It's the trial of the century. It's about free speech. Uh, it's about uh, the measures that people want to take to control all our lives you know and fossil fuels and private cars and us traveling on planes you know and we're and europe's much further advanced than america in in that dream and uh, so this is this is the and of course there should be no debate about climate it's settled science now but unfortunately in a courtroom you have to argue your point so i think this is this is where climate activism meets uh, meets perjury um, and meets you know no more political slogans. You have to you have to lay out your, your stall and convince the jury. So we we have the transcripts. 
I mean, it's as you say, it's streaming, but unfortunately, you're not allowed to record the streaming or put it out on podcasts. I might add. So we have the next best thing. We get the transcripts every day. We have the we have actors in LA three hours behind reenact the most dramatic parts of the trial, and we get it out in a podcast. So you get the most interesting parts of the trial every day in your inbox. And uh, I think it's it's uh, funny. It's 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 the modern world. It's it's the perfect podcast vehicle. This is this is the perfect way to tell to show a trial and to bring people into the courtroom and podcasts are perfectly designed for that. Yeah. Well, what do you think is the most dramatic? You know, you've been there every day um, and you've had actors reenacting what you and Anne have picked out as the most dramatic uh, portions of the trial. What would you say is the uh, number one or number two most dramatic moments so far in, in after what, five days of, uh, of court action? Well, to, to misquote Dick Cheney, there are the no one, no ones, and the unknown, no ones, and the no one, no ones. You know, we have the no one, no ones that uh, that the jury are most shocked by. Like Michael Mann is a fake Nobel Prize winner. I mean, the jury's jaw dropped, right? You know, and not just a fake Nobel Prize winner, a frequently frequent flyer, fake Nobel. He has claimed on multiple occasions, dozens of occasions, to be a Nobel Prize winner, including on three occasions to the very court where he's alleging Mark Stein lied about him. So the jury was, got, I mean, it's a DC jury. And whatever you say about DC juries, you can guess they all know what credentials are. They may all have military backgrounds or military involvement. They know about ranks and they know about stolen valor and they know about Nobel prizes. So that for the jury, that was shocking. What else was shocking? The jury was shocked by his email about Judith Curry, where he basically claimed that she'd slept her way into a PhD. Uh, and it turns out, you know, he was completely wrong. He, you know, she when she when he when she committed the evil, she already had her PhD. She was at the college at Penn State as an employee, not as a PhD student. So even the gossip was wrong, the smear was wrong. Was, he shouldn't have been saying it. Uh, so the, they were pretty shocked. This is, I'd say it's a pretty Me Too jury there, and hmm. they were pretty shocked by that. Now then, for, for we know this. I mean, people, a lot of your listeners will know this. But then there was the stuff that we didn't know that Michael Mann is not paying one penny for the twelve years of of legal of legal battle. Michael Mann sent an email saying the investigation into him by Penn State was a cover your cover our asses, but he wrote a dollar sign dollar sign e dollar sign, and that it was only a a job just saying you know to keep the funders happy. We are investigating, but he knew nothing was coming from it. Uh, the fact that he has um, thanked. Graham Spanier and every book he's written, including one a year ago. Graham Spanier is a convicted felon uh, who was convicted of child endangerment for covering up Jerry Sandusky's uh, crimes, child abuse crimes at Penn State. The list goes on and on. Yeah. Uh, Can go I ahead, Sterling. Yeah, so two things. Um, I agree with you that the... Uh, you know, he had to, it was interesting watching man backtrack multiple times on the stand being forced to, to backtrack. He, he, uh, he, he admitted that, yeah, he, oh, I shouldn't have passed along that gossip. That was a mistake on my part. Uh, mm. uh I, and his lawyer had to, it. he called man's repeated claim that he was a Nobel prize winner, a mistake. Oh, we had the document, uh, from the IPCC. It was a mistake. Uh, it was a mistake that he kept repeating after the Nobel Prize Committee had basically told him, "You ain't a recipient." So yeah. uh, that's not a that's not a mistake. That's fraud. No. Um, yeah, and I would I would say that one other important thing, Sterling, is that no other scientist, no other climate scientist, has gone forward with this IPC certificate and said, "I'm a Nobel Prize winner." Nobody mm -hmm. else has done that. So, but the, the second thing, and this is sort of a a broader claim about the trial. You, you said it was the most important trial of the century. I'm, I'm not sure that it's the most important trial of the century, but it is broader than the most important climate trial of the century because not just Correct. because it's about science, because it's Correct. not just about science in the U S as importantly, or more importantly, it's about free speech. We have an yes. old thing called the constitution. Yes. Then the very first amendment says okay. we have, guarantees the mm -hmm. free speech we have as part of nature. And if anyone is a public figure, 
that can be and public figures are open to being mocked in the U.S. They can't get away with it in Canada anymore. I'm not sure about the U.K., but in the U.S., you can mock public figures. Gosh, just ask Trump or Biden, for that matter, whether they're being mocked daily. So, Michael Mann, I don't think this trial should have made it past the courtroom door. I think the court should have said, sorry, there's absolute immunity for free speech. You get, you, you're a public figure, you call people names, you get to be mocked. And if you don't like it, well, that's too bad. That's what the Constitution guarantees. Couldn't agree more. And that's why this trial is so dangerous. Yeah. Well, what, one of the things I'm kind of enjoying about the trial is is getting all of this kind of stuff on the public record. And this will be a permanent public record. And a lot of it is quite humiliating for Michael Mann. And is, this is a comeuppance that uh, is long overdue. We, we um, unlike you, Felon, we were not uh, able to afford to hire actors to uh, reenact using the transcript. So... Uh, um, I did. I did some AI. I, 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 did, I found an AI voice replicator, and um, we have our own little. My attempt to be ten percent as good as what you guys are doing, uh, and this is a passage where um, Michael Mann's attorney, uh, John B. Williams, is questioning Mark Stein about his view that Michael Mann didn't actually earn a Nobel Prize. Play that up for us, Andy. All right. Let's talk about the Nobel Prize. You've mentioned that a number of times. Correct. And the initial complaint in this action referred to Dr. Mann as a Nobel Prize recipient. Correct. Three times in that initial statement of claim. Right. And when you have criticized Dr. Mann and his lawyers for this mistake, were you aware of the underlying facts as to why that statement was made? If you're saying that he was one of thousands upon thousands who contributed to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, just as the half a billion citizens of the European Union presumably contributed the European Union's winning of the Nobel Peace Prize, so that anybody on the nude beach at Saint-Tropez can claim to be a Nobel Prize recipient. Then, yes, I was aware of the underlying background. Thank you for that. Were you aware of the certificate received by Dr. Mann and the other scientists who contributed to the IPCC work? The certificate run off at the IPCC branch of Kinko's? As you well know, wherever it was run off, were you? You don't know where it was run off, do you? Well, I'm aware that. You don't know where it was run off, do you? Do I know who mans the IPCC photocopier? No. <laughs> no. Okay. Thank you. So, <laughs> that's my little attempt, uh, Phelan, to try to catch up with the great work you're doing. Um, did you use any of your actors to reenact what I thought was... was uh, a? A, a very poor attempt by man's lawyers to kind of have a gotcha against Stein and he flips it around on them with, with the kind of humor that I think probably the jury appreciated. Yes, yes. Now the jury are very good at doing the old poker faces. Um, no, they, yes, we, that, we didn't miss that one. And uh, interestingly, uh, yeah, no, that was a stunning, I mean, that was a stunning part of the trial. And the, very interestingly, man has given evidence to his own lawyer i.e his own lawyer through softball questions you know you wrote this nasty you know trying to downplay the nasty emails and all the other things he's done wrong in the past 15 20 years and man was able to soft soap them but look interestingly his own lawyer never asked michael mann about his fake nobel prizes it's one of, one of the few topics he didn't go there it's unanswerable it's 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 mind-blowing it's and the the problem is the you know, weeks before the trial opened, Michael Mann was putting on his own website headlines that claimed him to be a Nobel Prize laureate. And it's like, oh boy. Yeah. So Phil, I got I a question for you. I got a question. Yeah. Now, we can't see the jury during the live feed. Can you see uh, the jury when yes. you're in the courtroom? All right. So, uh, do you, I, I know the jury is instructed not to show any emotions, but do you see any hints of anything like people smirking or eye rolling or anything like that? No, they're very good at a poker face, to be honest. Now you can try and see when they're taking notes, um, but you know, they're very good at a poker face, you know? Um, now Mark got them joking, laughing once in, a, in an exchange, but so did Michael Mann, to be fair. Um, Mark comes across as a, you know, a reverse uh, New Hampshire Yankee in the court of King Arthur kind of thing, uh, mixed up with a bit of Jack Nicholson, you can't handle the truth. Uh, whereas 
man comes across as oh i'm just a just a bumbling scientist you know and worldly matters are so where is that document <laughs> you know that uh, worldly matters are so above me which then doesn't um are below me i just don't care about the nitty-gritty of real life but then when he's confronted with these smearing emails that he devotes a massive amount of time and energy to smearing people whilst a you know pretending to be this scientist who's above the fray i don't know how the jury i think a lot's going to rest on the uh, summing up when yeah. when they're able to bring it all together well, they, they presented evidence that uh, in emails that Michael Mann called Stephen McIntyre, who was one of the first and most prominent critics of his hockey stick graph, a human piece of filth. <laughs> and he had other very contemptible things to say about a lot of other scientists. And you mentioned how he went after Judy Curry, uh, alleging yeah. that she slept her way to a PhD. This is, no, a, no. this is a nasty piece of business, Michael Mann. It's even worse than that. Like, on... The trial opened on Tuesday. The reason the trial didn't open on Monday because it was MLK Day, Martin Luther King Day. On Martin Luther King Day, Michael Mann wrote an, a, twi a tweet uh, comparing Steve McIntyre to a white supremacist because of his use of statistics, right? Oh. And it's like, so, so uh, you know, as, as Mark says in these opening states to the, judge, uh, to the jury, according to this man questioning the use of proxy data versus real temperature graphs uh, is the equivalent of burning a cross on, on your lawn. That's who who is claiming that he was damaged by a blog 12 years ago. I this wish I wish he could bring that up in the trial because no, my did. suspicion is, oh, that would be very effective with a jury in D.C. Um, yeah, yeah, he did on the in his opening speech, and I, and I have no doubt – Mark is going to get to it in his uh, cross examination, which continues uh, on Monday. I have a question. I, I want to say, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Sterling. I'm going to take this one. Um, I, I was wondering what your thoughts are based on the performance that you've seen so far and everything on uh, Mark representing himself. Because that, when I heard that was happening, sorry, I got nervous. Representing himself. Well, look, you're, you've got the erudite, well-traveled, super intelligent Mark Stein with a foreign accent uh, who is, you can't handle the truth versus Michael Mann pretending to be a bumbling scientist, not being able to read, oh, which memo was that? No, you know, but with a nasty streak underneath, right? So you tell me, it's, it's, I don't know, right? You know, I don't know what is going over well with the jury you know my that was sort of my concern uh Linnea's point um you know one thing about man I, I i noticed this he never when they ask him do you see is this what it says and he says he, he never says yes or yes that's what it says he says yes that appears to be what it says like well okay it either says or it doesn't it's not a matter of an appearance uh he, but he said, sort of hedge. It seems to me, in some way, he's academically hedging his bet. So, it, well, yeah, yeah, it, it appeared that way, but it was wrong. Yeah. No, uh, listen. Uh, but sorry, we just don't know. And, and he won't give a straight answer to a question. If he's asked a yes or no question, he gives this long line. You know, a, a long answer. And you know, I think I was speaking to someone close to the trial there, and they said, and. Bradley give evidence, MBH, Mr. Bradley, one of the hockey stick off co-authors, very, very boring. And, and to a certain extent, Michael Mann's answers are quite boring. And, you know, the the, the thing is, as, as someone said, boring witnesses sometimes sound authoritative. Mm -hmm. uh, asking emotional questions or bombastic questions can sometimes sound, you know, irrational or not you know, you know, what will the jury respond to? Will they respond to this guy speaking in a monotone voice about three proxies and, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, and central European temperature graphs and, you know, and divergence? Or will they say this man is a fake Nobel Prize winner? This man uh, tweets, calls people white supremacists. This man smears female academics and he has the cheek and the gall to come here and demand money for a mean stare in Wegman, aisle nine of Wegmans. <laughs> yeah. 
I actually wanted to get to that, Philip, because I think when people are watching this trial, especially when you have a long period of time where his attorneys are uh, doing the questioning and then a long period of time when Mark Stein is doing the questioning, as the plaintiffs in this case, it is um, the, it is incumbent upon, he needs to prove his case, does Michael Mann, yes. that, that a single blog post seen by maybe thousands of people, so millions know about it now, but they didn't know about it at the time. So good job, Michael Mann. You're a great PR guy. Hmm. Uh, that that blog post, one by Ransomberg and one by Mark Stein, has caused him um, such harm that it's worth, I don't, I don't know what he's suing for, but millions of dollars. But it's yes. his job to prove this. And yesterday, as you hinted at Phelim, he, um Mark Stein went after, because in the claim by Michael Mann, he says that uh, one of the some of the proof that he has been defamed and it has negatively affected his entire life was that he was shopping, grocery shopping at a Wegmans in State College, Pennsylvania, and he got a dirty look from a guy in an aisle. Now, yes. Mark Stein, I thought, had a really <laughs> fun time um, poking at that by um, asking him, does he remember what aisle he was in? And I guess uh, Michael Mann said he remembered he was in aisle nine. And uh, Mark Stein said something to the effect, um, you know, let's say you were in the pet food aisle. How are you to know that that man gave you a dirty look because you didn't take the last can of Fancy Feast salmon <laughs> or something like that? Uh, and it was, I, I just thought that was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. Um, but again, you smell that bad or something like is, poking, that. is poking at it because, and, and then again, we're also to believe, and Michael Mann told the jury, and I want to, I want to know if, if you had, if you got the reaction of the, the jury to this story that Michael Mann told, he said that one of the biggest pleasures of his life used to be going grocery shopping on Saturdays with his wife and with his daughter. And now that pleasure has been taken from him. Thanks to Mark Stein. <laughs> That's what he told I mean, the jury. I am not kidding you folks. That's what he told the jury. Felum, had, not did, only, did you look at the jury when he, when he told that story? They, they, they remained poker face, but you, you met, you know, he, his voice broke, as he said it to you know, one of the, uh, one of the biggest pleasures I had was, was one of the few things we did as a, as a family, <clears throat> you know, that kind of, you know, produces on, onion and rubs it into his eye kind of thing. Um, <laughs> You know, the jury, no reaction, but um, look, the, no reaction. Yeah, it was it was aisle nine. And, and by the way, I want to just correct the record there, Jim. It, and Mark Stein was actually talking about the cat food department, not the um, not the pet food, because as you know, Mark is a huge cat lover and has produced an album called Feline Groovy, available on good record stores. Correct, um, yes. So, uh, yeah, I noticed Mark talked about the Fancy Feast salmon. So, yeah, yeah. Look, um you know, and, and literally a man gave him a bad stare. Some guy called Mustafa Overlord at gmail.com wrote him two nasty emails. But there was all sorts of things like Mark said, how do you know that that the money, the grant money that didn't arrive to you after this article wasn't because Penn State was involved in the biggest scandal uh, in its history? Do you not think the donors might not have been too keen to give money to a, a, a university where the president enabled child abuse, um, where the, the co-chair of finance, the vice president of finance went to prison as well, was in a jumpsuit. I mean, who'd write a check to that institution? So look, we can, you know, but it all depends on the jury, you know, yeah. and they, they might buy it. Well, Phelan, you mentioned on your podcast, I think it was the first episode of your podcast, Climate Change on Trial, that I listened to the other day, that Bill Nye, the science guy, is attending there as a supporter of Mark Stein. And I think- you No, know, Michael Mann, I believe. Michael Mann, of course, yes. Michael Mann. My apologies. <laughs> that would be a big about face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nye and Stein rhyme. It just got messed up in my head. Uh, and, and I think you had talked about it in your first podcast, how Bill Nye got a chance to kind of hang out with the jury or, you know, that there's a chance that since he's such a big Michael Mann supporter and he's just there chatting up the jury, how do you allow it? How can that happen? That seems weird that you have a celebrity who is uh, in support of Michael Mann chatting up the jury. Well, exactly. You tell me how it happened. So so what happened was that the, the courtroom, uh, they were they had to get all these jury pools because it's very hard to get a, a neutral jury in DC on this. And I'm not sure they've succeeded, but they had to get jury pool after jury pool. So the jury pool would be sitting outside the courtroom and one person would go in to do the questioning and then another person would go in. So there's. 50 people sitting in these chairs outside the courtroom where we normally sit. And we, 
walked away. When we saw the jury pool was there, we walked away. We walked to another corridor and sat there. But Bill Nye, the science guy, sat in the middle of them. And of course, people started, because they're all bored, people started talking to Bill Nye, the science guy. And he said to them, yes, I'm a huge fan, huge friend of Michael Mann. And it's like, mm. well, Do Bill's, you think maybe I, he was trying to force a mistrial by doing that? Or he was trying to uh, pollute the jury pool. Anyway, we don't know what happened because it was there was a war deer uh, before around that time. And, but at the end of the war deer, the judge gave a very stern announcement uh, to the court uh, that people were not to uh, pollute anyone and not to speak to anyone and to obey the rules of the court. And if anybody doesn't obey the rules of the court, they'll be thrown out. Hint, hint, Bill Nye. So. Um, yeah, yeah too no, these late. are man, that's frustrating. Too late. Too late. Yeah. Well, I um I, I want to follow up. I don't want to dominate here, but um I, I want to follow up on, on a question that Linnea had, and it's the idea of Michael Mann serving as his own attorney. Um he, time, time, he, he does have a couple of consultants, right? But he but I, I think, but Michael Mann, I, I believe, has four attorneys. Um, and as you mentioned, maybe we can return to this. Uh that it was shocking revelation that he hasn't paid a dime in a 12 year litigation. If you go to the, if you go to the, the page that outlines all of the legal activities in this case, in the last 12 years, it goes on and on and on. Every time you have to do something like that, it costs money. I believe it costs Mar um, Mark Stein like 750 bucks just to walk into the courtroom when the trial began. It's, it's quite outrageous, but Michael Mann hasn't spent a single dime. And um, obviously, this has been very financially ruinous to Mark Stein. But, you know, Felham, yesterday when I was, after making fun of uh, uh, Michael Mann for um, no longer being able to enjoy the pleasures of grocery shopping on a Saturday afternoon uh, in the cat food aisle, he started to kind of go after, because I think Michael Mann, or I'm sorry, I think Mark Stein wants to put Michael Mann's hockey stick on trial. I mean, he's mm -hmm. been wanting to do this for a long time. And I got to be honest, when he was trying to poke holes in the hockey stick um, to Michael Mann directly with questioning, um, Michael Mann's response would always be, no, you're wrong. You don't understand. Would you like me to explain it to you as a scientist? And although I know that um, Mark Stein is going to have some scientists on the stand probably next week, um, to me, it seemed like if I'm a juror, I'm more believing Michael Mann's hockey stick is is good, and Mark Stein doesn't know what he's talking about. So that was a little concerning to me as somebody who's pulling for Stein. Can I? Yeah. Just just before you respond, uh, my other concern about that, um, just as a matter of trial protocol, mm -hmm. I know that they are allowing him a little leeway because he's yeah. representing himself. But honestly, I think the judge is being pretty patient with Mark in some respect. Judges don't usually like it if you talk over them. Right. Once he says something, they don't like you contradicting or speaking while they're speaking. And I'm really surprised the judge didn't say, sir, when I'm speaking, you will not. And if you do it again, uh, there will be sanctions. I want to point out that you're funny. I want to point out that the funding, most of the funding that man is getting for this trial, if not all of it, is coming from this organization called the Climate Science Legal Defense Fund. And I know this because I know who founded it. And I talked with them. I was at a um, at an AGU convention a few years ago, and they had a booth, and they were soliciting for funds from other scientists just to protect Michael Mann and everybody else from these terrible legal attacks that they have, right? And what and the fact is, is that man is the one that's starting all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to talk uh, about your point first there, Jim, the hockey stick debate. Yes, they right. did get into a back and forth, a very complicated back and forth about the hockey stick, which I, you know, as someone who's interested, I was actually interested. It's funny. I was actually interested in the hockey stick debate. And you're right. Michael Mann had an answer for everything, sounded convincing. But... Um, Maybe uh, maybe in the closing argument of Mark, maybe I don't know, I have no insight. Maybe he's going to say, look, were my questions not valid? Were his answers not interesting? Were my responses to his answers not interesting also? Are you suggesting, he is suggesting this debate should not happen. I should not ha be allowed to question him. That is what he is saying here, right? That I should not be allowed to question the validity of his behavior of his, uh, you know, I know he's questioning a bit more, but by, if you say, I cannot criticize this, then you're, 
you're stopping this important debate. Maybe that's what he's going to say. I felt you're right. I don't think he scored any marks, short, scored any huge points there, but I think he should, scored a point about this is interesting. This, this, or if you're not interested in it, it's important, right? So maybe that's where he's going, you know. But also, never underestimate the, you know, man has to answer truthfully and he has to answer honestly. And it's not like Congress where uh, politicians are trying to score points. This is actually analysis of why he did what he did and when he did it. Regarding the judge, uh, Mark speaking over the judge, uh, uh, we just posted the last. Uh, podcast from yesterday, the most recent one, and you'll hear at the end, the judge give Mark a very strict admonishment about speaking over witnesses and speaking over other people because he said, look, I have job, I have two important jobs here is, is to make sure the jury get to hear things without, well, you know, it clearly, but the second one is uh, to make sure that there's a good record of this trial for the Court of Appeals. And if yeah. you speak over each other, the stenographer cannot write what happened, and that is very serious. So I will not stand for people speaking over people. So good point, Sterling. You hit the nail on the head, and uh, that the judge was very clear about that. You know, this whole trial has been laughable from the start. And I, to show you just how laughable it is, a couple of minutes ago, I mentioned the Climate Science Legal Defense Fund. Okay, this picture here, is of Professor Scott Mandia. Yes, that's an actual for professor. I believe he's at uh, up at the University in Rochester, New York. Anyway, point is, this is the guy that started the Climate Science Legal Defense Fund, and he dresses up as Super Mandia with a hockey stick. I mean, this is how these people present themselves. It's, oh, it's, it's kind laughable. of funny. It's it's like it was probably some silly, goofy thing that he was doing for laughs from someone somewhere. I don't I don't think that we can really judge him based on something like that. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Renee, I've admonished you for being too nice to people on this podcast before, so don't let me <laughs> do it again. Yeah, I, I think it would depend on the context. If it was Halloween, right. I would have no problem with it. But if he was walking down the street on a random day, uh, <laughs> yeah. I will. I will say the thigh highs are a little bit. Um, disturbing sometimes motion <laughs> motion to, you know motion to uh, disagree here I, I agree with linnea actually look you're talking to the guy who dressed up as a polar bear at at, at the copenhagen climate <laughs> conference right so All you right. know you know i mean uh, let's not throw uh ice snowballs uh, um people who live in costumed glass houses should not throw uh, snowballs of climate. That's a, yeah. Did you maul anyone medical. when you did that? <laughs> Sorry? I said, did you maul anyone when you did that? <laughs> only only verbally. Ah, all right. Uh, I just I just hope you were counted in the polar bear census, proving once again the number of polar bears are growing. Hmm. Well, Sorry. Phil, I, I, so I imagine um, you're talking with Mark, um, you know, during breaks in the trial and maybe afterwards, perhaps you've gone out to dinner. Um, I wonder, because Mark Stein has spoken at, um, like you, has spoken at one of Heartland's climate conferences. In fact, we played his presentation. This is what's so funny. Uh, from 2015, um, he spoke for about 30 minutes about his this this case and it was hilarious it was great it brought the house down it was just a fantastic performance and also very inspiring and i realized that more and he was complaining about how long this trial was taking and more time had passed between when the lawsuit was filed and that speech in 2015 or i should say more time has passed from that speech to now than when the the lawsuit was filed and then he gave that speech complaining about how long the dc uh court process takes in this country um, but you know, he's, he, as people may know, he's had some health issues. I'm sure this case has contributed to them. He's had three heart attacks. Um, he complained in court, no, complained. he mentioned in court, it was so hot in the courtroom. He was having a hard time, frankly, just staying conscious perhaps, but certainly concentrating. He says he has low hemoglobin. Um, so, you know, a lot of people listening to this podcast have read and listened to Mark Stein for many, many years and have great affection for him. Uh, can you give us kind of a sense of how Mark Stein is doing physically and mentally right now as this trial is, is proceeding? Well, I mean, I, I don't want to talk about personal stuff I may have talked to him about, um, 
But I mean, it's all there on the record. I mean, he was asked where he lives, right? And he says, I live wherever I have my most re recent heart attack. And he outlined the three heart attacks that he has had. He is in a wheelchair. Um, he, the, the courthouse, now I've been in a lot of courthouses in my journalistic career. It's not the worst courthouse, but you know, the, one of these windowless rooms with inadequate air conditioning. So what we have had this really, really cold spell in DC. So therefore the heating was turned up and it's one of these small, low ceiling windowless rooms. So now we've had an unprecedented kind of, not unprecedented, but a warm snap in DC. So the building is not, it's heated up so much, it can't cool down in the day. So yesterday we were actually, and, and I think I saw Mark write about it, and he's told the judge, I have low hemoglobin. And he said on his website today, you know, the British Medical Association says, if you have low hemoglobin, you're not supposed to be in a room more than this temperature. And he was, he was sitting in it for three to four hours yesterday. They had to open the doors. They had to bring in a fan. The judge actually ended, and this is a trial that has already overshot. It's a lot of time. And the judge actually ended it earlier because the, the room was intolerable for the rest of us. The judge said to the jury during breaks or at any time, if you want to stand up and stretch and try and catch a bit of air, do it during the trial. We don't mind. That's how uncomfortable the room is and how. So this is, you know, this is not a good place for Mark Stein and his current health situation. Yeah, you know, it reminds me of, of what happened way back in June of 1988 when Dr. James Hansen and, and Senator Timothy Wirth sabotaged the hearing room when they first brought the global warming issue before Congress. And they checked with the Weather Bureau and found out what was going to be the hottest day. And then the night before, they went in, opened the windows to the courtroom and disabled the air conditioning so that when they had cameras on people, people were sweating. You know, and it was just it it, it it reminds me of the same kind of thing. They're they're they don't seem to care about the stagecraft that seems to be going on, although it's probably just a, a utility problem with this case. But, you know, the whole global warming premise was started with stagecraft of a hot room. If their science was so strong, why do they need to do that? I mean, because because image counts, you know, you, 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 we, the, it is evident from the world today that honestly, sadly, image counts in many instances much more than substance. It, that goes back to Nixon Kennedy debate. Uh, Nixon looked old and tired, uh, and Kennedy never looked old and tired, and he won that debate and it changed the course of, uh, of the election, I suspect. But let me ask, let, let me ask you, Phelan. Um, uh, they mentioned Tim McIntyre and the lawsuit in Canada in the court. Tim Ball. Uh, Tim Ball. I'm sorry, Tim Ball. They brought it up a couple of times um, and how it was uh, a man got it wrong, who he had sued. Uh, he had to correct himself there. Um, but they, I'm wondering if you think they will bring it up again because what is important about that trial, it seems to me, is how it ended. The court in Canada directly asked, no, directly directed Michael Mann to provide his data for analysis. And at that point, he refused to further participate in the trial. And the court was left no... Uh, uh, um, option but to find for ball because a man would not participate and they they said he was he he owed court cost he owed damages and of course they can't enforce it in the u.s because that's a canadian court but he sued in a canadian court i, I wish they could sub not subpoena him but uh uh what yeah. is it uh get a, get a yeah seize his assets but more importantly i wish that they could issue a, an arrest warrant and say look expedite him yeah <laughs> or, uh, yeah extradite extradite, extradite, extradite him yeah. to canada Based on well, the fact that he he brought a case, he lost the case. There's a judgment against him, and um, I'm I'm hoping they bring that up because it's important. Oh, He's already lost this case once. Listen, um, I'm glad you mentioned that actually. And if you listen to today's podcast, we just dropped it from yesterday's court case. It was the first thing that Mark brought up. So, uh, Man mentioned it on Wednesday in Wednesday's court uh, about well, you know, yeah, I sued Tim Paul. 
but you know there's only so many resources you can bring to a court you know okay. so i decided to focus on these two cases so mark opened yesterday's hearing uh to with the judge and said i need to bring your attention he called the judge my lord which i kind of like my lord um to a perjury that was occurred in this court yesterday M dr mann perjured himself by dr Ma tim the tim ball case he didn't let it languish the case was dismissed and in fact if you look at michael mann's facebook page he says it was dismissed and he's going to appeal it right so he perjured himself to this court um and you know that, that so that so that is ha has been brought up and he brought it up again with dr mann again professor mann kind of slidled away from it but no no tim ball is being is being brought up and uh it was brought up in the mark's opening statement where he said he sued tim ball uh into penury and uh, he died poor he, he his funeral was crowdfunded so the jury got that uh, in the opening statements and i'm sure they'll get it again in the closing statements well I'm yeah and i think somebody else said for the opening statement thank you yeah go ahead no, no, I just well, you're wanted gonna, to say I, I missed that. So I'm glad you sit. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Um, were you gonna say something else, Phelan? Was there something else you were gonna no, say? No, I, I think I was I was just gonna yeah, the, no, I was gonna repeat myself actually. I realized now the judge the judge um has been has been I think somebody said the judge has been very lenient of Mark, I would say. Uh the, I know Mark was critical of the judge in his blog post, but the judge has, you know, as we would say at home, has allowed him to kind of get away with murder a little bit you know um making speeches instead of questions um that kind of thing being argumentative with michael mann whether the jury would like the arguing with michael mann I'm, i don't know um but the judge has been has i feel the judge has allowed uh mark stein to, to get away with a lot yeah well, well actually I, I let me uh, weatherford is what's the is it Ver uh, the, the the i'm sorry i'm sorry i should back up the attorney for Rand simberg the co-defendant in this case um, who also had a blog post that Michael Mann didn't like and decided to make a literal federal case out of it. Um, his, his attorney, uh, Weatherford, Weatherford, I think is her last name. I should have looked it up. I apologize. Yes. Uh, I've heard her a lot on the stand, and I think she's been doing a pretty fantastic job um, of going after Michael Mann and bringing things up. I mean, obviously, she's an experienced litigator. So when Michael Mann would try to filibuster or you know, dodge around the question or not answer yes or no, she was pretty firm on making him confirm a lot of the uh a lot of the things that are you know about him basically being an, a real nasty piece of work and he has to admit to those things yeah well if you, wanna, if you listen to her, go ahead linia you were going to say something. yeah i just wanted to jump in real quick and say uh and alan griffiths i know andy said that we'd save it for the end but i want to acknowledge the super chat right now because this is pertinent to what we're talking about he said, man has to prove he suffered damage or loss. If his claim is based on nothing more than a means there in a grocery store, then he's already lost. And so the question wraps back to, you know, the issue of, you know, the, the judge is giving Mark Stein a lot of leeway. But I still don't understand how, like, what man's argument is that would justify having a jury trial all the what that made it you know 12 years you know and actually going to trial and not just looking at it and saying nah that's silly and then just tossing it out i don't i don't get how it's gotten this far it has been one of the sticking points for the judge all along all right there's been several judge the judge keeps bringing it up in when when the jury's not there what are the damages you have to prove damages tell me and i think there's going to be an application when the plaintiff's case ends there's going to be an application for dismissal without going to the jury because he has not proven damages right nasty emails from mustafa overlord and uh, uh, bad stairs mean stairs in aisle nine of wegmans in uh, state college i don't think qualify now he he his argument is I I lost lots of grants and Penn State lost lots of grants, but then how do you know that Penn State didn't lose the grants because of the Jerry Sandusky scandal? How do you know that, by the way, and there were lots of other articles comparing Mann's investigation with uh, Jerry, the Jerry Sandusky investigation, the Chronicle of edu Higher Education, which is read by every administrator and every grant administrator on the planet, 
also made the exactly the same comparison months before. So how can man prove that it was these blogs in relatively small uh, publications that caused him the loss? And I think it is the weakest case, a weakest part of man's case from a legal perspective. Whether the jury will see it like that is a different thing, but the best chance they have of getting it summarily dismissed is th uh, through the um, is through that, yes. Well, I think they've made a strong case that he keeps making more money every year. Uh, yep. That he still has the respect. It, it didn't ruin his reputation among, certainly among his peers, his so-called peers. Yeah. Um, but um, and the damage, I, I wish they had hammered, and maybe they will come back to it. But his loss of grant funding. It's not his grant. He said several times, I lost my grants. No. You apply for mm -hmm. research dollars, and sometimes it's awarded, and sometimes it's not. And there's no way to know whether he, um, other grant proposals were just better that year. Somebody else had something that was more intriguing. There's only so much research dollars to go around, and they got it, and you didn't. You weren't the golden boy that year. Uh, it could have been the Sandusky, you know, it could have been anything, but the point is he doesn't know. And I would point out they aren't his, he can't assume I'm going to get, I think he said, oh, I got 60% of my grants funded, uh, prior in the, in the four years prior, but only 22% after. Okay. Well, maybe your, your proposals weren't as good. You know, you were let, resting on your laurels, uh, yeah or the, the research topics weren't as interesting to the government as the other ones. I, well, he's got no I way think, knowing. Well, as yeah. it's, it was said in court too, you know, look, there was other things happening at the time. There was the Sandusky scandal, but also don't forget there was the climate gate emails, hmm. right? So, I mean, those call, I mean, I know he was exonerated as he keeps trying to say in all these reports, but I mean, people who give grants don't like people talking about, uh, deleting uh, files and deleting emails. People who give grants don't like people talking about high, using tricks to hide the decline. People, you know, people don't like, they don't like that. It's, it creates a bit of a smell. And he, he was told, you can subpoena the records of the people who refused your grant. You can, you can subpoena them to come to court and say, I didn't give Michael Mann a, a grant because, or I, sorry, I, and you're right, if I was brought up too, it's not Michael Mann's grant, it's the, it's Penn State's university, Penn State's grants. I didn't give Penn State a grant because uh, of these articles, but he has not done that. And he said, well, we, we wouldn't do that. That's a bit nasty in the academic world. I wouldn't like to go there. Well, you know, you're claiming your daughter was in tears or whatever, or you can't go shopping in aisle nine anymore. So it's a serious blow. So uh, you should, one thing I want to point out, we talked about the fact that man's salary kept increasing ever since this, this whole thing started, you know, which kind of disproves his damages. But in addition to that, he got a new position. He left Penn State and went to the University of Pennsylvania down in Pittsburgh, got a new position running a whole department. He got a promotion. So where again is his damages? It's just not there. So nope. I want to go... I I'm just going to say, Penn, Penn is Penn uh, University of Pennsylvania is in Philadelphia, not Pittsburgh. So, yeah, yeah. So anyway, let's let's see uh, what we've got from questions from our viewers, um, and, and and take a look at that. Um, let's get the first one. Engineer guy, SC says, is the fake news media reporting on this trial? I haven't seen a lot of coverage on it. Have you, Helen? No, the fake news media haven't. And let's be fair here. By the way, the, the conservative media have been awful in covering this story. I have to say, like, where's the Washington Examiner? Where's, you know, Daily Caller? Where's Fox? I mean, come on, guys. This is this is a seriously important. By the way, journalists like writing about journalists. This is a journalism story as well, as much as anything. Mm. May I ask concerning that? Um, so the press isn't really covering it, uh, but he's got he's got his experts coming up man's experts have largely been thrown out because they weren't willing to, to deal with data mm -hmm. um but but stein has his experts coming yes my question is does has the aclu or any of the free speech defenders uh are they lined up to defend 
uh, Stein and uh, uh, what Simberg? Yes, I think no, I think Marcus said they they submitted briefs to the court in the run up to this, saying it should be dismissed on a free speech basis, on a constitutional basis. I think they have. I think he's had uh, a bit of institutional support from that, but they're not outside holding banners, you know. No. So our next question. It. Oh, go ahead, Linnea. All right, right, I can read the super chat. Okay. All um, right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter Williams. Uh, he says, when man loses this case, he might go, go after you guys next. So you might need a bit more uh, cash. And I think that there was a little bit of um, uh, typo problems happening when he wrote this up. But I understand you, Peter. And thank you so much. And like we made the joke last week, yeah, you could be right. We might need the we might need the cash after our coverage of this. So thank you. Yeah. So the next question from Slartabat Slarty Bartfast says, Will Arctic ice have completely melted before this trial ends? Well, see, that's the other big fraud in climate science. They kept telling us after 2007 that the Arctic ice would be gone by 2011, and then 2012, and then 2013, and then 2016, and it never happened. And it stabilized, and it has not disappeared during the summer. So I would think the trial would probably be over before the ice melts, if ever. Well, that's the the problem there is I think she was sort of, or the, per, the person, it may have been he, I don't know, is commenting on the fact that this trial might not be over when this trial is over, that this could go That's on for, for years, right? I mean, appeals and appeals. And who knows, with with Mark's health, uh, sadly, um, it, it could be a Tim, a, a Tim Ball situation. That, uh, yeah. uh, and, of course, it's not exhausting any of uh, man's funds because he's not mm -hmm. funding it. It's convenient to sue when there are no costs being borne by you. I wish the okay. court could say, you know what? If he loses, I'm saying if he loses, I wish the court could say it's not sufficient that this is paid for. It has to come out of your pocket because you are the litigant. Yeah, Unfortunately, he's probably got more money than Stein and can withstand this for years. Rico Man asks, from what you've said, hasn't Bill Nye given a huge gift to Stein? Isn't that single event where he was talking to the jury? enough to toss the case out or change venues or select the new jury or throw it out altogether? One would think. Well, I think, I think Mark Stein does not want a, a further delay. You know, um, maybe it's grounds for appeal, um, but he does not want a further delay. Um, and uh, that's, that's, uh, that's my feeling is that it's been delayed enough. I mean, they were all here, I think in November for, for the trial and the judge got ill the day off the trial of the day before so you know they, i think they want to get it over with at this stage so that, that's my understanding i would and i would think it would be understandable enough to, to think that well do you know if during vert war dwyer when they questioned the jurors because I, I think you said you weren't in the in the room when that was going on uh, maybe i'm wrong um if if i mean the judge could have asked directly or one of the lawyers could have asked directly did you, Bill Nye was out there. Did you speak to him? I mean, that that might have been grounds to disqualify some of the the jurors individually, is if 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 they were the ones that Nye actually spoke to. I'm assuming he didn't get to speak to all fifty. No, no, it was a long, narrow corridor, and I think the people around him spoke to him. And I don't know if if the jury was asked specifically about that, but I know the judge was made aware of it. Yeah. Hmm. So well, I have a question. Do you know if any of the, the jurors have any kind of technical or scientific background whatsoever? No, but given that it's DC, um, no, we were kept out. No, of you don't know or no, they don't? No, we, do, no, we don't know. But yeah, And it's unusual. Normally, you're allowed in for the board year for the, for the journal, for the jury pool. In this case, we were excluded from the court. Um, it's DC. They look, you know, they look professional. They look, uh, they look like they go to work every day, you know, and it's DC, so they probably go to, you know, some some government place or, you know. So I would say, you know, given my, you know, I, I look at them and I, I, you know, your biases always come in. They look like they, they wouldn't be out of place in a suit. Some of them, you know. So I think I think it would probably be a more a, a credentialed jury. For and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. 
Yeah. Well, Ephelim, I know that you've had an, uh, an encounter with uh, Michael Mann. I know you're putting yourself in legal and perhaps physical jeopardy. I uh, We actually have a clip here that uh, you, I think you posted this on Twitter. And uh, I, I, I I hope you're I'm not mad that I grabbed it because I thought it was uh, it was great. We're going to play it without the without the sound. But you, as a journalist, you have a right to uh, talk to Michael Mann on the street uh, outside the courthouse, and uh, you're getting jostled here by his attorneys and his and the other uh, uh, you know ruffians, which which he surrounds himself. So why don't you walk us through what's going on here and why you're doing it? Well, yeah, that's not my footage. That's someone else's footage. That's me trying to ask Michael Mann some questions. And that you can see there, his lawyer is jostling against me and, and pushing me. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and that's John Williams telling uh, Patrick Coyne to stop assaulting me, basically. It's, it's bad. So I'm asking Mann, this is after Mark Stein's opening speech, I'm saying to Mann, why did you falsely claim to have a Nobel Prize? Would you like to apologize? I'm asking Mann, why... Did you want to hide the decline? What was the decline you wanted to hide? And this is Peter Coyne, who yesterday was the person questioning Matt. And Coyne uh, takes the opportunity to smack his phone against my phone on several occasions. So, um, you know, there's as as and you know they then lied in court about me assaulting Matt, and uh, they also said I refused to identify myself. Actually, I have them here. I have the business cards of uh, of John Williams and uh, Peter Fontaine, uh, who, uh, which I got off them in court, and I even put a, made a little note, that's what I was doing, and I said they represent, I went up to them, I said, I'm Phil McAleer, I'm doing a, uh, you know, I'm a journalist, I can have your business cards, I want to check your spelling and your role, and they gave them to me, and John Williams said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm doing a daily podcast, and, and he says, oh yes, I've heard of that, and then on video, you, you can actually see him here asking me to, to identify myself. I give my name and uh, he bangs his phone against mine. And uh, that is in, then John Williams gets up in court and says, uh, sorry, uh, this man, I don't know who he is. He refused to identify himself. And I'm going, you are a liar. I said that. And uh, the judge wow. was very upset. Well, the, that's not my footage. Now, if you want to see our footage of this, Go to Phelan Mac, at Phelan McAleer on Twitter. I think at one point, uh, the taller of the lawyers uh, that didn't do any assault was, in fact, stopping his yeah. colleague from pushing you. I think he actually identified you by name. He, he said something like, Phelan, please get out of the way or something like that. Or uh, I could be wrong, but I thought I heard him say your name right there. I must check the tip. Yeah. I mean, it's a, if you get if you have a look at my footage, you can see it much because uh, we've got two cameras. One on one watching what they do to me, and one uh, watching Mr. Matt. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> if an, an attorney mischaracterizing the truth in court, color me shocked, fellow. I gotta say. <laughs> well, yeah. um, we have what I one more question. I think we should get to um, by uh, Roy Epen, who has come to I think Roy every one of our uh, climate conferences, and he has a good question and and i was having this in my head as well can the judge dismiss the case as not being proved i mean uh Phelan, you had mentioned that in the sidebars i guess when the jury's out of the room the judge said you know look you got to prove harm here so if the judge is bringing mm -hmm. that up is there a chance that before it ends the judge will just say you're you haven't proven your case or maybe at the end of all the presentations not even letting the jury decide and just saying this 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 uh, proceeding is now moot. You have not come remotely close to proving damages. I rule in favor of Mr. Stein. Bang the gavel and trial. Yes, yes, he can. The short answer is he can. Uh, he has mentioned it, I think, in, in the run up to the trial and, and pre-trial conferences. Where's the, where's the beef? As I say, where's the damage? So yes, he can, and that's what that's what I believe they're going to try and do. Okay, Thalem, can you kind of give us a, a quick wrap up and uh, once again? pitch where your people can listen to your podcast yeah they can go to climatechangeontrial.com or or as they say wherever you get your podcasts we're, we're directing everyone to apple Podcasts. it's just the most convenient one to use asking them to leave a rating and review i should have said we are the sixth most popular science podcast on the planet uh so yeah you can get it there so we're the sixth most popular uh science podcast on the planet imagine if we were number one so did you say people, sixth? Yes. Number six? 
Yes. Because you were yes. you were number 17. You were number 17 in episode two. So you're really moving up, Phil. I'm oh no, we're really moving up. I mean, and uh I mean to me, that's my ambition is to be the number one. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, there it is. Number six. Let me try and put it up. Yeah, number six, the sixth most cool. popular science podcast on the planet. So please go and leave a rating, leave a review. Hold on. There, there we go. It's number six. You see that? Besides Neil deGrasse Tyson, he's beating us. Uh, so let's beat Neil deGrasse Tyson and uh, let's get the, let's get that going. Uh, leave a leave a review, leave a rating, send it to all your friends. You can get us on Twitter. We're, we're also kind of live blogging the trial, but it's our live tweeting trial, but it's difficult. The judge is banned. Uh, phones and laptops from the trial. So go to my Twitter, Phelan McAleer, P-H-E-L-I-M, McAleer. Um, and, uh, you know, but listen, go to Apple Podcasts. That's where we want everyone to go to. And uh, you can, and, you know, let's make it the number one science podcast on the planet. Wouldn't that be funny? Very cool. Very cool. Thank you from all of us for going there and and taking the time to listen to this. Uh, and asking the tough questions when you can, when you're out on the street, and and for being with us today. It's just fantastic. And we're going to continue to cover this trial over the next couple of weeks. I want to point out we have some great websites for you to visit. Uh, first of all, there's climateataglance.com, where we have factual information, climaterealism.com, uh, and, uh, of course, um, energyataglance.com, and whatsupwiththat.com. But I also want to give a special pitch to Mark Stein's website, because if those of you are wondering how do you support this man in this fight against Michael Mann and, and fighting for truth, Mark Stein is selling autographed hockey sticks. The, he calls it the Liberty Stick. So you can go to steinonline.com and buy one of these things and help support his efforts. And I, I encourage you to do so. All right, that's it for us here on episode 95 of Climate Change Roundtable, Climate Trial of the Century Part 2. I want to thank you all for joining us. And join us here next week where we talk more about this plus other topics. I'm Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate from the Heartland Institute, wishing you all a great day and a fantastic weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.